I picked this topic for our sermon this morning, and let's look at the context that comes from this woodwork. Do I have control? Okay. There we go. This comes from 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should, and Paul's writing this, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And that sounds like Paul was concluding that this was to kind of humble him a little bit. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. We talked quite a bit in the adult Sunday school class about how we need to transform from our natural instincts, specifically love of self, but all of the different ramifications of that, to loving God and loving others. This is dealing with an, another aspect of our personal ev evolution as a child of God to taking a completely unnatural point of view about infirmities and struggles and reproaches and necessities, our needs, distress. Paul gave as an example of his own situation that he had a problem that he prayed three times for and was finally told, my grace is sufficient for you. Well, when we look at Paul's life, there was a lot of grace given to him. There was the poisonous snake thing. There was the shipwreck stuff. There was a huge list, and I thought about including that list of all of the, the beatings and the left for dead, stonings, prison, all kinds of things that Paul survived. And the fact that he was given a traumatic wake-up call and he responded appropriately to that, that's grace. That's a wonderful blessing to be turned completely around and headed in the right direction. Let's look at some other texts here. In Hebrews 11, and we're going to read quite a bit, in this chapter. What and what shall I more say? For the time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire. And all of these sound mostly positive. Now, I doubt that Daniel was really looking forward to being thrown in the lion's den, but it was really nice that the lions didn't eat him. I'm sure that the Hebrew children did not look forward to that furnace that killed the guys that threw them in, but it turned out pretty cool literally, kind of. It is wonderful to subdue kingdoms, to 
work righteousness to obtain promises. But there's some other elements of that. And then it goes on to say, escaped from the edge of the sword. Well, I don't think any of us want to be at the edge of the sword in order to be in a position to escape. But it's nice to escape. From weakness were made strong, waxed mighty in war, turned to flight armies of aliens. Women received their dead by a resurrection. Well, I'm sure the dead part wasn't enjoyable, but the resurrection would have been extremely. And others were tortured not accepting their deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Jesus pointed out that there's two resurrections, and so do other prophets. Some to eternal life, some to everlasting contempt and eternal destruction. Ceasing to exist forever. But some did not accept deliverance from torture that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. That's a career-limiting move, to be sawn asunder. They were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and the holes of the earth. There's a huge spectrum of life experiences from creation till now. And we can't expect to be any different. It's important for us to understand why the grace was sufficient and how to apply that to our experiences in life. Why? Why would that be important? What might happen to your faith if you find yourself in situations like this? What might happen to you emotionally if you find yourself in situations like this? Now, what we have been reading so far is that the believer is encouraged to respond appropriately, to rejoice, to take comfort in hardship, and that's totally unnatural. It takes a great deal of faith. It takes a great deal of conviction that it's going to work out, that it's going to be okay. Maybe not today, but it's going to end up okay. And these all, having had witness born to them through their faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing concerning us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So they knew that they weren't getting the promise yet. And this indicates that all believers are going to get the promise at the same time. In 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 16, Peter writes, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Which is to indicates a future condition. So Peter is preparing them for fiery trial. And if you know church history, you know that the early centuries of the church were ripe 
with all kinds of persecutions and trials. So it's important for us to know ahead of time things are going to get rough. It may not be that everybody's going to be sawn asunder. It may not be that everybody's going to be thrown in a lion's den. I'm pretty confident in that assessment. But we're going to have trials. And we need to prepare ourselves for how to respond. And we need to think about why would God allow that? Well, it's called a trial. Trial is a test. It's also a process. And as we look at these scriptures, let's try to get our heads around, why would God allow this? Peter says, don't think it's strange, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Why are Christ's sufferings a good thing? It's obvious that there's a context in which we should think about his sufferings as a good thing that when his glory is revealed, and that's a future event, Peter's talking about Christ's second coming, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, and probably all of us have experienced this, certainly if you look at the way that this civilization views godliness and views righteousness, we, we should all feel reproached in that context. But I think that all of us have experienced it personally, more directly, somebody actually saying to us that they question our sanity, that they don't agree with us. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. If we respond appropriately to harsh treatment, that glorifies God. And it's part of the process of us becoming godly. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Mind your own business. If you get in trouble because you weren't, then that's on you. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this matter. Peter also says in the first chapter in verses 3 through 9, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's Father was also his God, Christ's God, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. And this is that reward that we read about in Hebrews 11 that all the believers will get at the same time that is reserved in heaven for you. And Jesus said very plainly, I am coming quickly, and the reward is with me. And many, many other texts witness to the fact that that reward is reserved in heaven, but delivered 
to the believer at Christ's second coming on the earth. It's reserved for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And that's exactly what this gospel that Jesus is bringing the reward at his second coming amounts to. A salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Peter's making an analogy to the believer being tested, and gold being purified by fire. So the trial process for us, those things we struggle with, are a refining process. And they are a witness to others that see faith in the face of trial. Though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's very consistent in this point that this reward is a future event. That what we live through day to day is a trial process, is a refining process. And that we need to get our thinking so that we can rejoice in those trials. That's a, that's a lot to get your head around, but it's very crucial. Whom, verse 8, whom having not seen you love, we are supposed to love Jesus, whom we haven't seen, and love his God, whom we haven't seen. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And in this context, and the context of all scripture, that's a future event. But absolute faith in that future event is what can facilitate an attitude of joy and an attitude of glory in sp because of hardship. Why does God test mankind? When you hear a lot of atheists explaining why they are atheists or agnostics, this is one of the topics that comes up frequently. There are horrible things that happen to nice people. And who doesn't think, I'm a nice people? So if a horrible thing happens to me, then obviously that's not just. So what do the scriptures say about why God tests mankind? In Hebrews 5, verses 8 through 9, we get an example. Though he were a son, and this is talking about Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience by his suffering. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He gave commandments. He got those commandments directly from his God. And he was commanded then to share those commandments with us, with the world, 
all of civilization. And tied to that is the obedience that he learned through the things he suffered. So there's, there's a benefit there. We need to understand that. In Exodus 20, this is part of the famous Ten Commandments, God says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, other gods, nor serve them. For I, Jehovah, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generation. Well, that doesn't sound fair. The third and fourth generation. Now, God said in Ezekiel 18 that the son does not bear the iniquity of the father, and the father doesn't bear the iniquity of the son. That doesn't fit with reparations, but this is what God said. So how can he punish the third and fourth generation? Let's continue reading what God says here. Of them that hate me. Oh. So there's a number of things that that helps us to understand. That he's not going to wipe out everybody that hates him, but he's going to punish them even to the third and fourth generation if they hate him. So the son doesn't bear the iniquity of the father, but the punishment can last through generations. And showing loving kindness unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What does this have to do with obedience? The previous verse said that or passage, said that Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. And it looks to me like this is talking about obedience. And it's talking about loving God. And it's explaining a very critical component of reality, that God is going to punish those that hate him and is going to show loving kindness to those that love him. And we can prove that we love him by the way that we handle suffering and by the attitude that we have, the faith that we have that he will reward. In spite of what it looks like this particular minute, he's in charge and he will do what he says. And we're going to look at a few verses here that talk about overcoming. And I want us to think about two things. What does it mean to overcome? And what does Jesus explain is the reward for overcoming? It's Jesus talking in these texts. And he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? Think about the reward. And think about what it means to overcome. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, Christ's works, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. There's some profound rewards for overcoming. And there's several components of this overcoming that has to happen. One, 
We have to overcome us. I have to overcome me, my basic instincts. And I have to change those instincts or deny them, kill them, mortify them. Some of the passages encourage. And I have to put on new elements to my identity. I have to put on a new man. I have to overcome myself. I also have to overcome the temptations of the world and the, the enticements that Satan provides. And I also have to overcome the struggles and the, temp the persecutions and the hardships and the challenges to, excuse me, the challenges to me mentally and spiritually because we're being afflicted in a number of ways and, and widely varied from time to time, whether it's poverty, whether it's health, whether it's the pressures of the civilization around us. There's all kinds of things that we have to overcome and we should get to the point that we can look at those as a challenge, as an opportunity to demonstrate godliness. This is God talking, and he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. There's a massive last will and testament, a covenant, that God has promised this planet and everything in it to a group of heirs. I want to be one of those heirs and inherit all things. God goes on to say, I will be his God. What does that mean? Well, what does a God do? If we look at the scriptures, a God protects, a God promises, a God blesses, a God rewards. He's just. He's faithful. He's honest and true and all of those activities and, and attributes that make up God. He's going to continue in that pure, righteous, just, loving role. If anything, even more so. And he, the overcomer, will be my son or my daughter, according to 2 Corinthians 6. Sons and daughters. But the fearful, and isn't that our normal response to suffering, to persecution, is fear? So we're encouraged not to be that. The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And remember, Jesus promised the overcomers they wouldn't be hurt by the second death. So there's some really key reasons why God tests his children and why he tries them, partially because it's training, partially because it's a great ministry to the observer. If you are faithful in spite of temptation and in spite of trial. Matthew 5, 
10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom in heaven, but the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That's a tough mentality to achieve, but we've got a responsibility to train ourselves and prepare ourselves to respond this way. For great is your reward in heaven. It's reserved there. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And we're not alone. This has been a pattern from creation till now. God's got a reason for the creation. He wants sons and daughters, but he wants sons and daughters that love him and obey him. He wants sons and daughters that have been purified, have been tried. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It's totally appropriate for us to see the suffering as unjust. But we also have to see it as an opportunity to prove faith and to demonstrate faith. Jesus despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest I be wearied, you be wearied, and faint in your minds. This is where the strength has to be. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. What if we have a relatively easy life? In the Sunday school class, Barb brought up the chastisement. If God loves us, he chastens us, it says. Well, what if you've got a pretty easy life? Haven't really been thrown in the lion's den. Chased around with a sword. Crucified. In Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, it writes, Two things have I asked of thee, deny me them not. It's kind of a double negative in a way. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who's Jehovah? Or lest I be poor and steal and use profanely the name of my God. There's testing in blessing. How are you going to use it? Are you going to become arrogant because you've done pretty well in life? Am I going to become thinking that I'm better than other people who haven't been as blessed? Am I going to say, I'm, I have this because I'm so smart. I worked really hard. I was very clever. There's trial and temptation. There's the opportunity to have the wrong attitude 
in both extremes. So even if we've had a pretty soft life, what should we be thinking about that? Unto whom much is given, much will be required, Jesus said. So have I adequately leveraged the blessings that I've been given? And have I had the right attitude about the blessings that I've been given is equally as important as have I had the right attitude when I was tried, tempted and tried, to quote the song Don suggested for us today. And I thought that's kind of interesting. So we've got a responsibility no matter how we find ourselves in life, if we're blessed, or if we feel like we're cursed. We've got to get our head right in those contexts. We're going to conclude with another writing of Peter's here. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Cinch up your belt, cupcake. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, the original me, Hopefully, there's a new me being built according to the pattern that Jesus delivered that his God provided to him. Not conforming yourselves to the former less as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Let's conclude with a song. All right, let's conclude today with song number 265, Joy Unspeakable. 265. Let's stand, please.
righteousness and wisdom that you have left for us. We pray that you would help us to understand those things you've written and that you would transform us to become pleasing in your sight. Please forgive us for our shortcomings and weaknesses. Please help us to see those things so that we may change and obey you. We thank you for the promise of that wonderful kingdom that you have established for those who love and obey you. And we pray that you would send Jesus soon to establish that kingdom and that each of us would be found acceptable. Please watch over, guide, and protect us as we go from here. Please be with all of your children according to their needs and according to your great wisdom and mercy. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.